1944, The Oval Office. According to Stanley Lovell's memoir, OSS Director William Donovan stood behind President Roosevelt as he dictated a letter to his secretary. Donovan raised a pistol and emptied the magazine. Roosevelt continued dictating, apparently unaware that a weapon had been discharged in the room. When Donovan revealed what happened, Lovell claims Roosevelt's expression shifted from confusion to fascination. He asked to see the pistol. This was the high standard HDM, and if the story is accurate, it demonstrated why American intelligence considered this one of the most effective suppressed pistols of the Second World War. The weapon would go on to serve covert operations for decades, from Nazi-occupied Europe to the jungles of Vietnam, to the cockpit of a U-2 spy plane shot down over Soviet territory. This is the story of how Bell Telephone Laboratories helped design a suppressor system for a pistol the OSS intended for clandestine killing. By 1942, America's newly formed Office of Strategic Services faced a problem. The OSS was responsible for espionage, sabotage, and covert operations behind enemy lines. Their agents needed to work quietly. Sentries had to be eliminated without alerting entire garrisons. Guard dogs needed to be dealt with silently. Prisoners had to be snatched from occupied territory, which meant neutralizing some targets while keeping others alive for interrogation. The weapons available were inadequate. OSS armories contained Colt Woodsman pistols fitted with 1920s-era Maxim silencers. These reduced the sound, but not enough. The mechanical action of the slide cycling back and forth produced noise that could carry across a quiet courtyard. The muzzle blast, though muffled, remained audible at distances that made close quarters work dangerous. To make a gunshot disappear, you cannot simply add a tube to the barrel. You have to defeat physics. A standard gunshot produces noise from three sources. First, the muzzle blast as high-pressure propellant gases escape the barrel at supersonic speeds. Second, the sonic crack of the bullet itself breaking the sound barrier. Third, the mechanical action of the weapon cycling. A truly quiet pistol needed to address all three. Subsonic ammunition solved the second problem. 22 long rifle rounds, with their relatively low velocity, remained below the speed of sound and produced no supersonic crack. The first problem required a suppressor to contain and cool expanding gases. The third problem was the most difficult. Semi-automatic pistols rely on moving parts. Slides travel backwards under recoil pressure. Extractors pull spent casings from chambers. Ejectors throw brass clear of the weapon, and return springs slam everything back into battery. Each action produces metal-on-metal -metal contact. Each contact produces sound. The British had already solved this problem, but their solution came with trade-offs. SOE, the Special Operations Executive, developed the Wellrod in 1942. This bolt-action pistol firing 32 caliber ammunition achieved a remarkably low acoustic signature by eliminating all mechanical noise. No slide, no cycling action, just a manual bolt that the operator worked by hand after each shot. The well rod was quiet, but operating it required two hands at ranges beyond ten yards. Reloading was slow. In situations requiring rapid follow-up shots, the weapon became a liability. American intelligence needed something different. A weapon that combined effective sound suppression with semi-automatic fire. A pistol that could empty its magazine in seconds while remaining quiet enough to use in occupied buildings. Stanley Lovell, Deputy Director of OSS Research and Development, approached High Standard Manufacturing Company in New Haven, Connecticut. The company had already produced thousands of Model HD target pistols for military training contracts. Lovell wanted something based on this platform, but with an integral suppressor. High Standard made pistols, not suppressors. For that expertise, Lovell turned to an unexpected source. In early 1943, the Ordnance Department awarded a suppressor development contract to Bell Telephone Laboratories. The choice seems strange until you understand what Bell Labs actually did. Their engineers spent decades studying acoustics, sound wave behavior, and noise reduction for telephone systems. The same principles that made long-distance phone calls intelligible could make a gunshot disappear. Bell Labs delivered suppressor design specifications to the OSS in the autumn of 1943. The engineers who created it remain anonymous. Wartime classified projects avoided individual attribution for security reasons. No patents were filed because patent documentation would have revealed the weapon's existence. The suppressor they designed attached permanently to a modified high-standard HD pistol, creating an integral unit that could not be separated in the field. The barrel featured a series of ports that bled propellant gases into the suppressor body before the bullet exited the muzzle. Inside the suppressor housing, two chambers worked in sequence. The first contained zinc-plated bronze mesh wrapped around the ported barrel section. 
This mesh acted as a heat sink, absorbing thermal energy from the expanding gases and slowing their escape. The second chamber used bronze wire screens and stacked baffles to further disperse and cool the gases before they reached the atmosphere. But here is the detail that ties back to the Oval Office. The design included a feature unique among Second World War suppressed pistols. A slide lock mechanism allowed operators to hold the slide closed during firing. This converted the semi-automatic into a single-shot weapon, but it eliminated all mechanical action noise. No slide cycling, no brass ejecting, no spring slamming metal against metal. According to OSS training protocols, operators could maximize suppression by filling the second chamber with water, oil, or shaving cream before sealing the muzzle with tape. With the slide locked and the suppressor properly prepared, the dominant sound became the bullet striking its target rather than the muzzle report. This is likely how Donovan's demonstration worked, if it happened as Lovell described. High Standard began production in late 1943 under the codename Impact Testing Machines. The complete weapon weighed 47 to 48 ounces unloaded, nearly 3 pounds with the integral suppressor. Overall length reached 13.8 inches. Magazine capacity was 10 rounds of 22 long rifle ammunition, fed from a detachable single-stack box magazine. The action was blowback semi-automatic, single action only, meaning the hammer had to be cocked for the first shot. If you are finding this interesting, take a second to subscribe. It helps the channel grow more than you would think. Now, let us see how this weapon performed in the field. Tracking the HDM through combat operations means navigating incomplete records. The classified nature of OSS activities meant minimal paperwork was created, and much of what existed was destroyed. What survives provides glimpses rather than comprehensive accounts. Training took place at Area B in Katokdin, the facility that would later become Camp David. The Pistol House, also called the House of Horrors, prepared agents for close quarters combat. The facility featured rooms with pop-up targets, dim lighting, and scenarios designed to simulate the chaos of clandestine operations. Agents learned to shoot while moving, to engage multiple targets in sequence, and to place rounds precisely under stress. Lieutenant Colonel Rex Applegate and William Fairbairn, the British close combat expert who had trained Shanghai police, taught instinctive firing techniques. Their method rejected traditional marksmanship with its careful sight alignment and slow trigger control. Instead, they trained agents to point the weapon like an extension of their arm, to fire rapidly at centre mass, and to keep moving. A March 1943 letter from E.A. Sykes to Applegate mentioned sending one twenty-two pistol silenced with night sights, among the earliest references to the suppressed high standard in OSS correspondence. The slide lock feature received particular attention during training. Instructors demonstrated how locking the slide transformed the acoustic signature of the weapon. Agents practiced the technique until it became instinctive, understanding that in certain situations, the few seconds required to manually cycle the slide between shots was an acceptable trade-off for near-total silence. The emphasis was on point shooting at close range rather than traditional sight alignment. OSS Doctrine considered the HDM effective from contact distance to approximately 50 feet. At these ranges, the 22 long rifle round, despite its small caliber, proved lethal when placed accurately. The key was shot placement. A 22 to the brainstem killed as effectively as a 45 anywhere else, and it did so without the muzzle flash and thunder that would bring enemy forces running. Records indicate the weapons were dispatched to European, Mediterranean, and Far East theatres by mid-1944. The British SOE reportedly received and distributed the weapons to agents operating in Nazi-occupied Europe. Jedba teams, the three-man OSS, SOE, and BCRA units parachuting into occupied France, had access to suppressed high standards among their equipment. French resistance networks received pistols through Allied supply channels. Two documented cases anchor the weapon's operational history with certainty. Francis Gary Powers carried an HDM when his U-2 reconnaissance aircraft was shot down over Soviet territory on May 1, 1960. The U-2 program represented the cutting edge of Cold War intelligence gathering, flying at 70,000 feet to photograph Soviet military installations. Pilots carried the HDM for survival situations, in case they needed to evade capture or defend themselves after bailing out over hostile territory. The Soviets captured both pilot and pistol. Power survived, was exchanged for a Soviet spy two years later, and eventually wrote a memoir about his experience. That HDM remains on display at the Central Armed Forces Museum in Moscow. Physical evidence of the weapon's continued service 15 years after the Second World War ended. The Soviets clearly recognized the pistol's significance, 
keeping it as a trophy of American clandestine capability. Admiral Chester Nimitz received an HDM as a gift from William Donovan. A photograph of Nimitz and his son, Chester Jr., firing the pistol, appeared in the Philadelphia Enquirer on November 12, 1944, inadvertently revealing the existence of the classified weapon to the public. The security breach demonstrated the tension between the novelty of the weapon and the need for operational secrecy. Senior officers wanted to show off this remarkable piece of technology. Security protocols demanded it remain hidden. That pistol is now displayed at the Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas, where visitors can see the weapon that was once considered too secret to acknowledge. How did the HDM compare to the British Wellrod? The answer depends on which characteristics you prioritize. The Wellrod fired 32 ACP ammunition, a larger and more powerful cartridge than the HDM's 22 long rifle. The British weapon used a manual bolt action that eliminated all mechanical noise. Period tests vary widely depending on setup, ammunition, and suppressor condition, making direct acoustic comparison difficult. What can be said with confidence is that the Wellrod, being hand cycled, produced a lower total acoustic signature than any semi automatic design could achieve but the HDM offered something the Wellrod could not. Ten rounds of semi-automatic fire. In situations requiring multiple targets or rapid engagement, the American weapon provided capabilities the British design lacked. OSS ultimately adopted both weapons for different mission profiles. The Wellrod for single-shot work demanding maximum stealth. The HDM for scenarios where follow-up shots might save an agent's life. The Soviets developed their own approach with the Bramit device a quick detachable silencer used on M1895 Nagant revolvers. The Nagant's unusual gas seal design, where the cylinder moved forward to seal against the barrel before firing, made it suited for suppression. NKVD operatives used these throughout the war. German suppressed weapon development lagged behind the Allies. Evidence exists for suppressed CZ 1927 pistols and Car 98K rifles with special low-velocity ammunition but no systematic suppressed pistol program comparable to British or American efforts emerged from the Third Reich. Popular accounts often claim the HDM produced only 20 decibels of sound. This is physically impossible. Dry firing a pistol, with no ammunition at all, generates significant noise from mechanical action alone. The 20 decibel figure, where it appears, represents the reduction from baseline, not the absolute sound level. The HDM was quiet for its era. Quiet enough that Lovell's Oval Office story is plausible, but not the whisper-silent weapon of legend. The suppressor itself was a consumable item. After 200 to 250 rounds, the bronze mesh degraded beyond effectiveness and required replacement. This was not a battlefield weapon for sustained firefights. It was a precision tool for specific missions where silence mattered more than volume of fire. Following the dissolution of the OSS in 1945, remaining HDM inventory transferred to the Central Intelligence Agency when it formed in 1947. The transition was not seamless. The OSS had operated with considerable autonomy, developing and procuring equipment as operational needs demanded. The CIA inherited this equipment, but also inherited the challenge of maintaining weapons whose production had ended and whose specifications remained classified. The weapon saw continued service through the Korean War, where CIA paramilitary teams operated along the demilitarized zone. Vietnam brought extensive use by special operations forces and intelligence operatives for reconnaissance, prisoner snatches, and targeted operations. The jungle environment suited the HDM's strengths. Encounters often happened at close range. Silence mattered in territory where the enemy might be anywhere. The 22 caliber round, marginal for battlefield use, proved adequate for the precision work these units performed. In 1967, Frankfurt Arsenal developed a replacement suppressor but according to period assessments, it proved less efficient and more bulky than the original Bell Labs design. The attempt to improve on a 24-year-old design failed. Sometimes the first solution is also the best one. Some accounts place the HDM in military inventories into the late 20th century. The weapon's longevity speaks to both the effectiveness of the original design and the limited alternatives available for suppressed semi-automatic pistols during the Cold War. Total wartime production reached approximately 2,600 units across multiple contracts. Surviving examples are extraordinarily rare. Legally registered HDM pistols in the United States number in the single digits. Original authentic examples with documented provenance have sold at auction for substantial sums. Modern reproductions by Arms Tech Limited, built on period host pistols, sell for several thousand dollars. The HDM helped establish integral suppression architecture 
as viable for military applications. Porting the barrel and enclosing it within a suppressor shroud remains the fundamental approach for integrally suppressed pistols today. A WC developed integrally suppressed Ruger pistols from the 1960s onwards, building on principles the Bell Labs design established. The silencer company Maxim 9, introduced in 2016, uses concepts that trace back to 1943. The weapon also helped establish 22 long rifle as a viable caliber for clandestine work, despite its apparent inadequacy for combat. The cartridge's low noise signature, minimal recoil, and surprising lethality at close range made it standard for suppressed pistol operations for decades. Modern suppressor technology has since enabled larger calibers to achieve comparable sound reduction, but for much of the 20th century, the 22 remained the preferred choice for operations where silence mattered most. The Bell Lab's contribution deserves particular recognition. A telecommunications company with no firearms experience produced a suppressor design that remained in service longer than its military-developed replacement. Their acoustic engineering expertise, developed to make telephone conversations clearer, proved directly applicable to making gunshots quieter. It remains one of the more unusual technology transfers in military history. The HDM also demonstrated the value of adapting commercial designs for military purposes. High standards target pistol provided a proven, accurate and reliable platform. The modification required was substantial, but starting with a weapon that already worked shortened development time considerably. This approach, taking civilian technology and adapting it for clandestine use, would become a standard practice for intelligence agencies in the decades that followed. Return to the Oval Office if we accept Lovell's account. Roosevelt examines the pistol that fired without his knowledge. The weapon he holds represents something new in warfare, a firearm designed not for the battlefield but for the shadows. For the agent who needs to eliminate a sentry and slip past without raising an alarm. For the operative extracting a prisoner from an occupied city. For the pilot downed behind enemy lines who might need to fight his way to extraction. The high standard HDM was not the quietest pistol of the Second World War. That distinction belongs to the British Wellrod. It was not the most powerful suppressed weapon. The Delisle carbine firing 45 caliber ammunition is often cited among the most effective suppressed arms of the war. What the HDM provided was a unique combination of capabilities, semi-automatic fire, effective suppression, and enough accuracy for the close-range work that covert operations demanded. Bell Labs went back to making telephone equipment clearer. High Standard continued producing target pistols, but for decades, the weapon they created together remained in service with American intelligence and special operations forces. The original suppressor design outlasted its replacement. The platform itself outlasted the Cold War. Some weapons become famous through mass production and battlefield dominance. The HDM achieved significance through precision application in operations that remain classified. 2,600 pistols, decades of service. And according to 